By the way, we used another, it's a good four-letter word. That's, that's a bad four-letter word, but W-O-R-K is a good four-letter word, amen? And so we talk about debt and how to eliminate that and what the Bible says about some debt. Tonight, we're really going to talk about the importance of giving and really have just a bit, little bit of biblical understanding. And I'm going to really talk to you tonight. It's really three reasons why you can't afford not to give, okay? Your budget cannot handle you not giving. And so this is, if you missed all the other lessons, this is the one to get. Um, so let's first of all go to Genesis 28. We'll look at verse number 19. This is a story with Jacob. And um, let's look at verse number 18 and read a little bit. Uh, he had, Jacob just saw a vision as he was journeying, and he paused in a place called, well, it wasn't called at that time, but we know it as Bethel. Bethel is the house of God. That's what it means. And um, I don't know how Jacob did this. I'm always, I'm, 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 I'm always not surprised by the angels and the stairway to heaven and the miraculous event that happened. I'm surprised that Jacob slept all night on rocks for his pillows, all right? How many of you are getting older and you realize, man, Jacob must have been a really young dude, okay? I'm telling you. Now, little kids can fall asleep almost anywhere, really almost anywhere, literally. But man, you get to some place, if I slept on rocks tonight for my pillows, I'll tell you what, you're going to have to call the ambulance. How many of you have ever woken up with your body just busted because you slept a little bit wrong, okay? <laughs> on a nice comfy bed and a nice comfy pillows board. That's what Marvel. Jacob slept on some pillows here. Verse 18, it says, he rose early in the morning and took the stone he had put for his pillow. Boy. He had to pick a good one. He set it up for a pillar, and he poured, he poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that place was called Luz at the, at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Now, I want to pause for a moment. This is Jacob. Jacob is always the deal maker. Have you caught that with Jacob early in life? Early in life, Jacob's the deal maker, and a lot of his deals were kind of tricky, you know, a little bit sinister. He was always trying to pull a fast one a little bit. That was kind of what his name meant. Notice how he said, if God will do this, and he'll do this, and he'll do this, all the days of my life, on my deathbed, then will he be my God. Do you see how that's a little bit backwards? By the way, that's not faith, is it? If I get to see it all, then I'll believe. That's really, you know, we get a little bit here. I'm not, I'm not all for this, Mr. Jacob, but I like the promise that he makes in the next verse. But up until that, he's kind of got a little bit of Downing Thomas in he, doesn't he? If I see it, I'll believe it. And God goes, no, 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 you believe it because I said it. How many of you knew that God already said he would provide Jacob's needs? He told his, he told his granddaddy, Abraham, and he told his daddy, Isaac. Did he tell him he would take care of him? He tell him he would multiply him and feed him. And if God will do that all the days of my life, then, no, no, no. You trust him now and see what God does. By the way, it's a little backwards. But Jacob was still living in the flesh. And he was still running from God until that day later on. We're going to study in Genesis, not tonight, but I remember when he wrestled with God. And uh, he had that moment where he wrestled with him all night. He, I want the blessing. And God said, okay, Jacob, you're going to do what's necessary. You're going to get that blessing. So we see here he vowed a vow. Verse 21, he says, so if I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Number 22, and this stone which I have set for a pillar, I like how that's worded. You see that word pillar? That's how the southern people call it. You didn't get it. Boy, some of you, it's, it's tough tonight. Pillow. Oh, I have set this for a pillar. Okay, never mind. I thought it would have gone over great the first time. See, when you have to explain it, the air gets all out of the, out of the balloon. I have set this stone, with the, uh, this, what I've set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And by the way, that's what Beth El means, the house of God. Beth means house, El means God. And of all that thou shalt give me. Now, this is a good promise, by the way. I don't think that first promise was actually that good, but notice what he says. All that I, well, you will give unto me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. 
And that's a great promise that we have. By the way, you'll never have your heart tied to God unless you have your wallet tied to God. It is, a, it is not only the biblical principle, it is a spiritual principle that where your treasure is, where your treasure is, there will your what? Heart be also. So there is a spiritual application tonight that is vitally important. And um, let me bow in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on the word of God, and then we'll just look at a couple principles. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful blessing of this morning, the wonderful blessing of this afternoon. And, you, and just, Lord, seeing so many victories spiritually. But, Lord, I am quite aware that there are a lot of spiritual battles at play, probably more so than at any point in our year calendar year thus far. But it's not, Lord, unexpected. But, Lord, I know that you have the victory. As we draw closer to you, we draw nigh to you, you draw nigh to us. As we submit ourselves to you, as we looked at this morning, we have the, we have the ability through your power to resist the devil and win each and every battle that comes our way. We ask, Lord, that we would seek your will as, we've met, as we spoke on this morning. But more importantly, Lord, that we seek it in our financial principles. That, Lord, we understand maybe through the first three weeks some good principles. Tonight, help us to understand really the whole purpose of why God has given us all that we have. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Giving is not a minor topic in Scripture. In fact, the word give is found 2,162 times in Scripture. 2,162 times in Scripture, God's people are instructed to give. This could, be an, this could be giving to someone else. This could be giving to God. But did you know that the word believe is mentioned 271 times? Pray, pray or prayer is mentioned 268 times. Love, love. How do you think love is important in the Bible? It's mentioned 714 times. So the word give is used far more than believe, prayer, pray, and, or uh, love all combined. How many think giving is important? In fact, it's really connected to a lot of other things. In fact, you can't really love without giving. How many of you knew that? By the way, what you give to, you actually already believe in. Did you know that? And really, there's a lot of worship, prayer. Really, if you want to talk about it, there's no greater form of worship than what you spend your money on. See, if you, tell, if you let me look at your budget, I can tell you who you worship. And a lot of us would say we worship God, or at least... Would, would say, I want to worship God, but really our bank accounts tell us a different story. And I'm not here to harp on that tonight, but God spoke a lot on parables. How many of you know that Christ made a lot of parables on giving, or at least spoke on giving a lot? Um, there's a lot of parables on giving. In fact, 16 out of the 22 parables, the primary takeaway was, guess what it was? Giving. Over two-thirds of Christ's parables the primary lesson was giving. So we really can't separate your money and your spirituality. In fact, some people say, well, don't, pastor, talk about something spiritual. Don't talk about my money. Did you know that it is a great spiritual issue? Finances. And so I know I do this quite often, but the Bible tells us the importance of giving. I've heard so many times this phrase, ah, I, I wish I could give. I just can't afford to. I'm going to preach you tonight. This lesson is going to be called, You Can't Afford Not to Give. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 6, verse number 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. I'm firmly convinced that the law of sowing and reaping, you ever read that passage? For whatsoever man soweth, that shall you also reap. I'm convinced that's also a giving principle, as illustrated here. How many of you ever realize if you want a great harvest, you have to plant a great crop? The Bible says with exactly how measure you give, that's the blessing you're going to receive later. How many of you want to be blessed if the Lord tarries in a year from now? You know what we need to start doing today? I'm convinced that we are, you are receiving now the harvest of your giving in previous years. And if you're, some of us, Pastor, I'm just not getting some of the blessing. Well, maybe we didn't plant the harvest of giving when the time was coming. See, you can't just wake up in the harvest and go, God, I want a blessing. God goes, you should have planted in spring. Because if we're planting one grain, well, you'll get one stock. But if you give generously, what does the Bible teach us? Hello? What does God say? 
You're going to receive, you're going to reap bountifully. So this is an important statement. I believe that you cannot afford not to give. When people say, I can't afford to give, does that mean they don't have enough resources? Now, I've never been over to Ghana. I've never been to some of the places that she has been to. I've been to the Philippines, and I've been to, you know, there's some people that live in some interesting situations right here in good old Lake Station, okay? We went yesterday, we went to a couple areas, different places. We went a couple weeks ago, and man, I knocked on this one particular, you don't even call it a house, a shanty. You think, does this place have electricity? Goodness, it does. It looks like a third world place, man. And when they opened the door, it smelled worse than a third world place. You're like, holy but holy cow, it is not so great. You know what? But I can tell you what. God has blessed every one of us. The great privilege goes to those who live in America today. God has blessed us with resources. And so I'm going to give you three reasons. If you could put those on the screen. If you have your paper, we're going to go to the middle. It's called Why Give. You see the middle there? And then I'll go to some other notes here and really talk about that a little bit more. But Number one, giving meets our needs. Did you hear me on that one tonight? Giving meets our needs. You can see it on the screen. You, I think you only have to write the word meets. Please write M-E-E-T-S, not M-E-A-T-S. Okay. Some of you carnivores can't help it. Okay. And some of you vegetarians are going to be offended. <laughs> giving meets our needs. Let me ask you a question. Does God command us to do something we cannot do? Let me ask you another question. Does God need our money? Is God poor? Is God the one shaking a can saying, I need you know, alms for the poor? Does God need a dime from us? See, sometimes we don't think about some of the very basics about God. God does not need your money. I've heard, I, I've, I've heard this since I've been here in the 10 years a few times. Well, I'll just take my money elsewhere. And I go, praise God. Because they think that's like a big gotcha. Do you know what? I don't want the drama to attach with the money sometimes, okay? In fact... I don't need your money, and God doesn't need your money. You know what God needs? God needs sold-out, willing vessels that say, God, I'm yours. And with that attitude, that's opposite. In fact, that's the mentality that's hurting churches. Christians that sit in it saying, I'll take my money elsewhere. Oh, be careful. Friend, God doesn't need a cent of your money. You need to give. We think about it all backwards. We think that, oh, God wants this. No, You need to give. God made you to give. There is a wire short-circuited in your spirit if you're not giving. There's something frayed. There's something that's not working right. And we think we're going through life. We're winning if we're not giving. No, you're losing. You're missing the point of money. You're missing the point of life. Giving meets your needs. How many of you, you were young, you thought getting meets your needs? Raise your hand. I can't wait till birthday and Christmas and oh, <laughs> give me, give me, give me. We thought getting get our, got our needs. But you know what? It is more blessed to what? Some, some adults still haven't figured that one out. They still are living in the getting mode of life. And they've never grown up to the giving mode of life. They've never recognized, and that's why we have miserable adults. You wonder why we have so many miserable adults going on around there. They've never learned really one of the basic principles This is a primary one. Giving meets your need. Okay? God doesn't need it. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I saw this last year. They were talking about this asteroid that was flying in our solar system. And this asteroid was primarily, predominantly made up of gold how many of you how many of you heard that story they said this this particular asteroid 
was about, it was about, uh, oh, a 20th the size of earth, but it was over 90% gold. They said if any person had this, they would have 20 trillion times the wealth of the whole earth combined. You know, God just waved that right through our solar system going, <laughs> that was a little pebble he flung through space just to show us, you know, people will die, cheat, kill, steal just to get wealthy. Are you with me? And God's got it all. God's got more than it all. He don't even, have, he don't even need the gold that is there. He could, he could just flick a pebble. He could make it. All right? Every good gift is already up from there. If you have anything, it's because it came from up there. He does not command us to give to meet his needs. He commands us to give to meet our needs. We are the one that has needs. He has none. You know, you ever find that way praising? Praising's not because God's like, oh, I'm just so insecure. If they don't say I'm great, I will blow my brains out. That's us. Right? He's not insecure in the slightest. He's got all nature singing his praises. He doesn't need you to remind him how great he is. You know who needs to praise God? Me. I need to remind myself how great he is. Because otherwise my head gets a little bit bigger. I poke myself right in the eye. My head gets a little bigger. See, God's poking me in the eye right there. Psalm 50 verse 10 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Amen and amen. God does not need anything from us. He is the provider, the creator, the sustainer. He reminds us that everything comes from him and belongs to him. Number two, giving points us to our provider. Amen? For God so loved the world that he what? There's not a moment that God is not giving, is there? There's not a moment that God's not giving. To everyone, everywhere, in all places. There is not a moment God is not giving. If there's one action word that can really describe our God, it's called, he's called the giving God. There is nothing good that he withholds. Did the Bible say that? There is nothing. He is giving. Giving, as we do it, frees us from the belief that we are our own providers. As someone once commented, the trouble with some self-made men is that they worship their creator. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Giving to God is a tangible way of acknowledging that we are not self-made, that all we have belongs to God and comes from God. Jesus told a man in Luke 12 of a man who missed this point. In Luke 12, verse 16, it, I'll, I'll read it. It says, And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have room to bestow my fruits. And, and he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine easy, drink and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. And then those things which shall be, I'm sorry, then which, I'm sorry, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, there's a lot of people that lay up treasure only for them. They've just missed the point of life like this fool. Do you catch me? I mean, this guy was building bigger. He was planting bigger. He was building bigger barns. He was getting bigger harvests. He was doing quite well financially. But the fool forgot to give. He was, giving it for, he was only living for himself. By the way, 12 times in those verses, how many notice how many times he referred to himself? He was not giving, and that, thus it did not remind him, it did not show him, it did not point him to his creator. Okay, The farmer's pride gave him a false sense of security. He wrongly translated God's blessing and God's prosperity into a misleading confidence in his own wealth and his own abilities and his own abundance. By the way, isn't that our tendency as people, isn't it? If we only focus on 
providing and taking care and only ourselves, we have a false sense of security. How many think, let me ask you a question. Which brings a man or a woman closer to God? Prosperity or being poor? Couldn't think of a better word there than uh, being destitute. There's a great word. Which brings someone closer to God? Prosperity or des being destitute? And so it reminds us who really is our provider. Okay? And then number three, giving teaches us to live by faith. How many of you would agree that a lot of Christians will spouse living by faith until it comes to finances? Right? Well, I'm for budgeting. So this is not, Pastor, you're contradictory. Oh, I'm actually not. I'm not, con I'm not being contradictory. You say you have to budge every penny. You have to see it. You have to know where it is before the month begins. That's not living by faith. Except for giving. Do you catch me on this one? What did I say is the first thing you do before you plan your budget? Give. Did you catch me on that one? Give. You, if you make that number one, see, most people do it opposite. If there's any left over at the end of the month, that'll be give. Nope. First fruits. You're giving first, and you're living off the rest. But, God, but, but I, 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 if I do that, I won't be able to make it. <laughs> Welcome to the life of faith. You have just entered the actual living by faith financially. Amen. Some of us need to put our money where our mouth is, and we can do it all except until it comes to this. You know? I'll, 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 I'll teach a Sunday school lesson by faith, Pastor. Pastor, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the fair booth by faith. I've never done that before. Amen and amen. Pastor, I'll do this by faith. I'll do that by faith. Let's start giving by faith. By the way, how many of you would agree? Living by faith requires us to give by faith. I think that that really, really is a big help. And by the way, teach young, young kids to start giving by faith. Obedience to God's plan forces us to live by faith. For faith is displayed by our obedience. Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouses, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that ye shall not be room enough to receive it. How many of you ever want God to pour off the windows of blessing, and then you'll give? You ever made a deal with God like that? Be honest. How many of you ever made a deal with God? God, if you give me a raise, I'll start giving. A God, <laughs> with a palm. Lord, if you help me win the lottery, I promise I'll give half of it to you. That's a great promise. Hey, hey, great deal for you and me, God. God goes, that's a terrible deal. Because that's never how God operates, is it? Because God says, I want you to bring me all the tithes in the storehouses. You give, you give to me, and then I'll open the windows of heaven. Give, and then it will be given unto you. Oh, God. See, it's time to put our faith into action. And some of us really need to activate that. Now we're in the church age. How many of you have heard, well, tithing. I had, I, had a, I, had a, I had a gentleman friend, and he, great guy. He came to church here. I picked him up and brought him here, I think four straight weeks. And he heard my teaching on tithing. He heard me use the word tithe. He sent me a long lesson on what we don't give. The importance of nobody today should give a penny to the church. He said tithing does not, should not happen. That was an Old Testament principle. He gave me a lot of things. And uh, it totally, by the way, totally backwards thinking in the age of grace. I even asked him this. He said, we're now living in the church age. We're now living in the age of grace. I do believe that we should live by more grace instead of less grace. You know, the Old Testament was not the age of grace, and they had to give 10%. Guess what we should be living in the age of, what should we, what should we be doing in the age of grace? More If, if in the Old Testament, they were in the wilderness, God required 10%. In nowadays, you're living in the age of grace. You already have the, you don't have to believe in the coming Messiah. We've seen it. It's been here. He's already he done it. We have his Holy Spirit. By the way, they didn't have that in those Old Testament times. Amen? How many are thankful for what you have over what they didn't? The Bible calls us very blessed. We are in the age of grace. You know what? Thank you, God, for your grace. I'll give 0% now. That, that's a little backwards to me. If God is bestowing more grace, then you should bestow more grace. Amen? That's the, that's the principle. And if you're living in the age of grace, it's my conviction that we should not give less grace than even the Old Testament required. Okay? In fact, I am of the conviction that if you're really a born-again believer, you don't go to the Old Testament and go, well, we don't have to live by any of that anymore. I think that we should actually hire those standards. Jesus said, well, I say unto you, 
You've heard it been said of old time, thou shalt not look on a woman to lust. I say to you, I'm quoting wrong. You've heard it said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. There you go. But I say unto you, don't even look without lust. What? That's a lot harder. <laughs> yep. You have heard that it has been said, I, thou shalt not kill. If you are angry at your brother without a cause, then you've committed murder in your heart. What? How many know the Lord actually, when you really want to make the Pharisees mad, he said, guess what? In this new age, you should actually be living under a much higher standard. And I know we're not required. That's called Christian liberty. Amen? How many thankful for Christian liberty? But if you have been given more liberty, you should be using it for grace. It's amazing to me how many people quote Christian liberty actually start living more filthy. You know, it's also amazing to me how many more people quote, say that you have to earn salvation or you have to keep salvation. They believe in a kind of a work salvation. How much of it, how terribly a life they live. I don't believe I have to do one thing from here to heaven and I still have heaven. Amen? But you know what? We don't live that way. The just shall live by faith. In God's economy, giving meets our needs. It points us to the provider, and it teaches us to live by faith. In God's economy, we are the givers. But guess who is the greatest benefactor of giving? The giver. You've got to get this down. When, these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is far more blessed to, than to receive. And most Christians have, do not actually believe that at all. Oh, they like to quote it. You know, around Christmas time, they give a gift, you know, as long as that person's giving them one in return or something, you know. But they're not really believe it. And it's time we started living by faith in these regards. Let me give you a couple, let me give you a couple points. First of all, the great misunderstanding, and we'll go to the house. I got a lot of verses and a lot of points, and I'm already out of time tonight. The great misunderstanding is actually a paradox. The mistaken belief is that the way to have wealth is to hold on to your money tightly. Okay? So there's a couple blanks in there. The way to actually have wealth is to hold on to money tightly. Now, that's a paradox that the world will actually give. Um, I love the Charles Dickens novel. Probably one of my greatest favorite books to read is uh, The Chris a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay. There's so many spiritual applications, and there's so many actually Bible quotes that are written in it. Um, the importance of even like a miser. You, ever, you know, like Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, in the, fir in the first page, you know, you read it. He's a grasping, clutching, covetous old sinner, you know? You get the idea, this guy is a miser. By the way, what do, you, what, what do you get if you add the letter Y to miser? It's the same word, by the way. It's the same root word. And everybody knows the tighter you hold the money, the more miserable you are. It's the actual definition of the word miser. However, many of us are trying to cling on to wealth tighter, and we're realizing it comes with more misery. The way, this is the, this is the paradox, the great way to actually get rich is to give more. They pull, and by the way, this is Dave Ramsey's course, if you ever know Dave Ramsey. Now, like I said, I don't, I don't subscribe to everything he believes spiritually, but he's got some very good biblical principles that even unsaved people follow. Did you know that Jesus said that sometimes the unrighteous are better at mammon than the righteous of this generation? And there are a lot of people that are winning with money with this principle. He said the number one principle that all millionaires, and by the way, uh, over 80% of all millionaires in the U.S. today started with a bank account of their parents did not give them a penny. Many of them even started in debt. Of those 80%, of those he pulled over 1,200 of those millionaires. He has a whole book if you read some of his book. Guess what they gave as the number one reason for their financial success? Can anybody guess? Give. Give Give as much as you can away. Isn't that amazing? I believe one reason God has blessed America with great wealth is there has never been a nation on the face of this earth that has given more. By the way, especially by the rich. How many of you know that Satan likes to demonize rich people? By the way, you might be, you might be one of those that demonize rich people. You've bought into the liberal mentality that rich people are evil. Did you know most rich people are rich because they work hard? I don't think that is evil. And do you know that most rich people, now there are evil rich people. We talked about the spiritual wickedness in high places. By the way, wealth does corrupt. How many of you agree with that? Power does corrupt. And it's not that power and wealth corrupts. It's that power, people with power and wealth are under great spiritual opposition. Did you know that? 
And if they're not grounded in the word of God, Satan's going to win those battles, I'll tell you what, right away. But giving teaches us to live by faith, and this is the paradox, that people think that holding on to money tightly increases wealth. No, people who hold on to money tightly do not gain wealth and do not gain blessing. You can write that down. You can take that one to the bank all day, every day, universally. If you are holding money tightly, not, hey, by the way, not, okay, no money gets out. Guess what? No money goes in either. That's a clenched fist, isn't it? Mine. God goes, fine. Giving with an open hand, God funnels that in. Number two, you, are, you and I are asset managers for the Lord. Managers. How many of you have heard the word steward? We'll get to that in the next one. If we view any dime you have properly, it's not your own money anyway. Catch me on that one? Are you with me? There is not a dime you have in your bank account that is legally yours in God's court. This is why when we stand before him, we have to give a what? We have to give an uh, sounds a lot like a bank uh, account. You actually, God's going to pull out your statements. Hmm. Looks like you didn't really give to me, did you? You want to explain yourself? I don't think I'm going to want to explain myself in that day. How many of you agreed with me? And by the way, he's going to have the real numbers, not the fake ones we lie about. Not the ones we give to the IRS. God's going to have the real ones, and we are stewards of it. It's all his. Okay? So we are simply, let, um, number two, a steward is a manager, not an owner. Can you imagine if you went to um, the manager of the bank and the manager of your local bank branch said, you know what? <clears throat> you haven't touched that money in a while, so I went and bought a whole new wardrobe with your money. If the manager of the bank said that, how many of you would want his job, want him to be fired on the spot? He should be. Why? Because he's just a, he's a thief. But he's just a manager. How many of you would agree? That, man, that money doesn't belong to him. You, had, you gave it to him to manage, yes? You gave it to him to manage. He, does he owe a dime of what's in your bank account? No. No, he's just a manager. <laughs> Well, they get paid hourly. I'm sure the bank does. But you know what? You're giving it to them to manage. It's your money. And should be. Time out. Someone said, what is, what is he? I wanted manager, but someone said, thief. What if God gave you money and you used it on you? You see why God said, yes, you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Well, where, where in have we robbed you? God says, yep, you did. You, you doggone right did. I gave it to you. And I just said, give some back to me. And you ran away with it. You know, and, 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 and so this is counter-Christian when we come with this attitude of, well, I don't have to tithe anymore. Who are you? You know, it's, it's really a backwards thinking. Why does God tell us to give so much, question mark? And I put in there 2,162 times. Um, it was quoted. It's 16 out of the 29 parables that, were, uh, that are about the primary lesson is giving. By the way, there's giving in other parables and a lot of other teaching and sermons and messages from Old Testament to New. Giving makes us more mature. Agreed? Well, it's going to be in the physical realm. Giving makes us more mature, Right? You ever seen a little kid give his, his favorite toy away or his sucker away? You know what? That's maturity, isn't it? It's not an easy thing for kids to do that. We usually want the opposite. Giving makes us more mature, and a spiritually mature Christian always gives. Number three, you can give without loving, and you cannot love with, but you cannot love without giving. I already said that. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Next, giving moves you to become less selfish. Agreed? If you, have, if you have someone who is selfish, teach them to give, right? I don't want to. Exactly why we have to give. <laughs> That's why. Less selfish people have a tendency to win in relationships and wealth. Hmm, I wonder why that is. By the way, there was a whole secular book written on this. That the more, the more, the more someone is, has a tendency to give things away 
the more the, the, the higher percentage of those people are in the elite upper class of financially. In fact, to the degree that you're predetermined by this is a psychoanalyst, this is not a Christian. It's a, it's a great, it's a great mental thing. People who are most wealthy got that way because they are predisposed to giving it away. I wonder how that is. Question, who do you think, who do you think is better at relationships and marriage? Those who give or those who are selfish? Well, duh. Every married person will tell you that one, right? There's a way, there's something in this life that you're going to actually be blessed greatly. And the principle is by learning to give. So there's a great principle, but by the way, there, there's a lot of paradoxes, especially with money that, we're, that is found in, woven throughout Scripture. Because we were designed in God's image, were we? Yes. We are happiest and most fulfilled when we tithe and give. Amen? We are, we are most happy when we are doing what we were made to do in the image of God. How many of you agree? We're most miserable when we sin. You know why? That's because that's contrary to God's nature. We were made in his image. And when we follow the principles of his image, we go, this is a beautiful thing. And so learning to give really enriches your life. Being selfish, boy, that just takes all the color out of it, doesn't it? <laughs> Instructions for giving. Let's go to the last one. A tithe is a tenth. When you hear that word in scripture, that just means tenth. It's a percentage of your increase. Write that word increase there. Okay? Write that word increase there. Because that's where the Bible uses. The Bible says um, in the book of Proverbs um, that we are to give of our increase. That's a, that's a very important thing, bringing in all wealth into storehouses of all your increase. I think it's the first fruits. I'm quoting the verse wrong. Um, we are to give of our increase. That means if you get anything, you're supposed to tithe off of it. Now, some of us don't think about this biblically a little bit. Did they have pictures of George Washington back in the Old Testament? Did they have Benjamin Franklin's floating around? In fact, a lot of times when this was written, did they even have... A, in the Old Testament, did they even have a lot of currency? A lot of that, they actually were buying and selling and trading. You know what I'm saying? The um, Bible even talks about some parables of things when, when people received either a harvest. By the way, you know, farmers, it does, you don't yet really know what you're going to get in the harvest, do you? But how many of you know that it all came from God? You say, well, I did all the work. I did all the planning. I did all the work. I did plowing and harvest. No, God did it. God gave you the sun and the soil and the water and the rain. God gave you the seed and God gave you the plant. God gave you the strength. God gave you the arms, the legs. He gave it all to you. You didn't do, really, you just did the little bit of work that made, that made it possible. But let me just give you that thought that increase is everything you have. See, we, don't, we only think of it as paycheck. Do you know when someone gives you a gift, that's increase? Well, it got quiet. You know, I understand the government giving money back, but you know what? We, uh, we give money back on our child, child tax credit. Government giving us some money here for having children, and amen, praise the Lord, that the government's giving us money for children. We're not going to say no, but praise the Lord, that's our increase. You say, they took that out of your taxes. No, not that. You say, boy, pastor, you're getting real specific. It's time we start getting specific. Because there's some things in our bank accounts and in our homes that we think is ours. Amen? And it was the goodness of God that gave it, and we still haven't given to him. You know, so the Bible tells us that we should give at least a tenth of all our increase. It's interesting the Bible uses that word. Okay? So the Bible says that the, to give the first fruits, which means off the what? Top, a common question, pastor, do I tithe off of the gross or do I tithe off of the net? How many know what we're talking about with gross and net? Because, of course, guess who gets their money a lot of times before you even see it? It's called Uncle Sam, right? 
It's gone, man. I, I saw this one video. This was several years ago, but this, this teenager, and he had worked his first job his first two weeks. He put in, he worked hard. He was so excited, and he was pumped. His dad, he got his check, got in the car with his dad, and he's like, we're going right to the bank. And he was so pumped. He opened it. He started looking at it. By the end of the video, he's crying because he saw the taxes they took out. <laughs> they took out over $100 out of his first check, and he was crying in tears. But that's my money. I work for that money. You know, he was, and dad patted him, welcome to life, son. Amen. <laughs> that's a part of it, man. You're not going to really escape that here in this world. You're going to have that issue. But did you know what? I would hate to give the government first dibs over God. Amen? So of all of our increase, if you're going to tithe properly, you go by the gross, not uh, the net, not like after taxes, you go before the taxes, how much you got paid of your wages. How many of you agree? You said, I don't know. Hey, is God real or is he not real? Before you come back telling me how it's not going to work, how about you trust God and I promise you it will work. You know how I know it will work? God said he'll take care of you. Amen? So try it. You know, I, I, I don't have time tonight. It is, the tithe is to go to your local church. I'll give my tithe to uh, Cancer for Kids Research. That's not tithe. You can give it to that. I think that's a wonderful thing that you give. But the 10% belongs to God. Now, if you want to take beyond that and you want to give to this need, this cause, this person, this uh, building project, that's great. By the way... We're we'll sharp some building projects up here in a little bit. Don't take your tithe and designate it for a building project. Okay? You can't tell God how to, how to pay the tithe. Okay? Can you imagine sending your NIPSCO bill and say, NIPSCO, you can only cast this check if, if you update my power lines on my street. You know what they're going to do? They're going to say, no. Nah. This is a bill. We get to decide what we're doing with this, Right? This is a bill you owe. This belongs to NIPSCO. It don't, you, don't, you can't tell us how to spend it. You know, the tithe belongs to God. You, don't, you can't tell God how to spend it. Now, your giving is specific. How many of you understand giving is a little different? That's over and above that. If you want to get, say, Pastor, I want to tithe 20%. You can't. You can tithe 10 and you can give 10. You catch me on that? You can't tenth 20%. That's what tenth means. Um, the local church, which provides the same function as the Old Testament storehouse, bringing all the tithes into the storehouses that there may be meat in my house. <clears throat> That's what it says in Malachi 3. And prove me now herewith. That will oftentimes references tithes with storehouses. Okay, um, Offerings are different than tithe. I already mentioned that. They are above the tithe and freely and cheerfully given. <clears throat> the Bible says that the Lord loveth what kind of giver? My air went out. It's hot in here. Lord loves a cheerful what? Now, you don't have to give the tithe cheerfully. Did you hear me on that one? Because you're not giving. It's what's owed. Now, I think it would be nice to give it with a smile. Amen? But does NIPSCO care whether you have a smile or a frown when you write that check? You know why? It's owed. But if you're going to give, God loves a what? Freely have you given? Freely give. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? If you're going to give... Put a smile on your face. Okay? And by the way, I don't think we understand the word sacrifice in, in America in 2023. Let's get real. How many of you have ever actually had to sacrifice? Like what they did in the book of Acts type of sacrifice? How many know that like they sold their homes? They sold their land? They sold their property? They sold their inheritance? You guys, you, let's get real here a little bit. We don't scrape hardly the barrel that people used to. What a sacrifice. We're doing quite well. Sacrif sacrificing people. Okay, I, don't, I, don't, I think we, we don't really get it. So anyway, lastly, the tithe is owed and is God's property. So that's basically what I'm going to close with tonight. We are simply owners and managers. How many of you understand the importance of giving? I do believe that as a family, as a person, you cannot afford not to give. To God. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless as we've wrapped up this financial series this last month, really, these last four weeks. I pray, Lord, that it's helped us to have a spiritual vision and understanding biblically of what you have blessed us with and understand our role in the money relationship. And there's so many spiritual applications. And Lord, Lord, it was a long, long lesson tonight. We ask, Lord, that you, as you wrap this up, 
Help us to have a biblical understanding. Be with Brother Adam as he preaches to us next Sunday night. Help your word to, of God to be made known and plain. And I pray, Lord, that it burn in his heart and as well as it burn in ours when we hear it. Bless the rest of this week as your people seek you in all things. Help us to live by faith. In your name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>